Group culture is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. We sense its presence inside successful businesses, championship teams, and thriving families, and we sense when it's absent or toxic. When we look at these organizations, we tend to focus on the people immersed in the culture to gain insight. We focus on what we can see, individual skills. But individual skills are not what matters. What matters is the interaction. In the book, Coyle presents his findings that cultures are created by a specific set of skills. Skill number one, build safety. How signals of connection generate bonds of belonging and identity. Skill two, share vulnerability. How habits of mutual risk drive trusting cooperation. And skill three, establish purpose. How narratives create shared goals and values. Let's explore. Skill one, build safety. Safety is the foundation on which strong culture is built. Where does it come from, and how do you go about building it? People inside highly successful groups describe their relationship with one another with the same word. Not friends or team or tribe, but family. What's more, like families, much of the communication is nonverbal. Supportive belonging cues. We use signals long before we use language, and our belonging cues possess three basic qualities. Energy. They invest in the exchange that is occurring. Individualization. They treat the person as unique and valued. Future orientation. They signal the relationship will continue. These cues add up to a message that can be described with a single phrase. You are safe here. You see me. How to build belonging. A misconception about highly successful cultures is that they are happy, light-hearted places. While they are energized and engaged, at their core, their members are oriented less around achieving happiness than around solving hard problems together. This task involves many moments of high candor feedback and uncomfortable truth-telling when they confront the gap between where the group is and where it ought to be. Researchers have discovered that one form of feedback boosts effort and performance so immensely that they deemed it magical feedback. One simple phrase. I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I know that you can reach them. None of these words contain any information on how to improve, yet they're powerful because they deliver a burst of three belonging cues. You are part of this group, this group is special, and we have high standards here. I believe you can reach those standards. How to design for belonging. Coyle goes into detail of his interactions with Tony Shea of Zappos and Shea's ability to develop belonging. He describes how at an event, Shea comes alive as he moves around meeting people, talking to them, introducing them to Coyle and to others. Coyle highlights how Shea had a connection with everyone, and more impressively, sought to build connections between others. Beneath Shea's approach lies a mathematical structure based on what he calls collisions. Collisions, defined as serendipitous personal encounters, are, he believes, the lifeblood of any organization, the key driver of creativity, community, and cohesion. Shea's tools are grade school simple. Meet people. You'll figure it out. In another experiment, different engineering companies were given the same challenge and observations were made of their working practices. What transpired was the most successful projects were those driven by sets of individuals who formed clusters of high communicators. Did they possess the same levels of intelligence? Had they attended the same undergraduate schools or achieved the same level of degrees? Did they possess the most experience or the best leadership skills? No. Only one factor seemed to play a meaningful role in cohesion, the distance between their desks. What mattered most in creating a successful team had less to do with intelligence and experience and more to do with where the desks happened to be located. Closeness helped create efficiencies of connection. Ideas for action. Building safety requires you to recognize patterns, react quickly, and deliver the right signal at the right time. Over-communicate your listening. It looks like this. Head tilted slightly forward, eyes unblinking, and eyebrows arched up, body still, leaning towards the speaker with intent. Spotlight your fallibility early on, especially if you're a leader. Open up, show you make mistakes, and invite input with simple phrases like, this is just my two cents. Of course, I could be wrong here. And what am I missing? Or what do you think? Embrace the messenger. 
One of the most vital moments for creating safety is when a group shares bad news or gives tough feedback. Don't shoot the messenger. You have to hug the messenger and let them know how much you need that feedback. That way, you can be sure that they feel safe enough to tell you the truth next time. Overdue thank yous. Thank yous aren't only expressions of gratitude. They're crucial belonging cues that generate a contagious sense of safety, connection, and motivation. Capitalize on threshold moments. When we enter a new group, our brains decide quickly whether to connect. So, successful cultures treat these threshold moments as more important than any other. Skill two, share vulnerability. The question, tell me what you want and I'll help you, can unlock a group's ability to perform. The key involves the willingness to perform a certain behavior that goes against our every instinct. Sharing vulnerability. When you watch highly cohesive groups in action, you'll see many moments of fluid, trusting cooperation. These moments often happen when the group is confronted with a tough obstacle. Without communication or planning, the group starts to move and think as one, finding its way through the obstacle as if they are wired into the same brain. The vulnerability loop. At some level, we intuitively know that vulnerability tends to spark cooperation and trust. People tend to think of vulnerability in a touchy-feely way, but that's not what's happening in successful groups. It's about sending a clear signal that you have weaknesses that you could use help. And if that behavior becomes a model for others, then you can set the insecurities aside and get to work. Start to trust each other and help each other. The second person is the key. Person A sends a signal of vulnerability. Person B detects the signal. Person B responds by signaling their own vulnerability. Person A detects this signal. A norm is established. Closeness and trust increase. Vulnerability doesn't come after trust. It precedes it. Leaping into the unknown when done alongside others causes the solid ground of trust to materialize beneath our feet. Being vulnerable gets the static out of the way and lets us do the job together without worrying or hesitating. It lets us work as one unit. Cooperation, though being vulnerable together, does not simply descend out of the blue. It is a group muscle that is built according to a specific pattern of repeated interaction. A circle of people engaged in the risky, occasionally painful, ultimately rewarding process. How to create cooperation with individuals. The Nyquist method. Coyle uses the story of Harry Nyquist, a quiet Swedish engineer in the Bell Labs, as an example. It had to do with regularly eating lunch with Nyquist. Nyquist possessed two important qualities. The first was warmth. He had a knack for making people feel cared for. Every contemporary description paints him as fatherly. The second quality was a relentless curiosity. In a landscape made up of diverse scientific domains, he combined breadth and depth of knowledge with a desire to seek connections. Nyquist was full of ideas, full of questions. People in all kinds of disciplines, on all kinds of projects, like talking about their project with someone who's working on something entirely different to put a new light on things. People like Harry Nyquist could capture what someone was doing, throw some new ideas at them, and ask, why don't you try that? The most important moments in conversation happen when one person is actively, intently listening. It's not an accident that concordance happens when there's one person talking and the other person is listening. It's very hard to be empathetic when you're talking. Talking is really complicated because you're thinking and planning what you're going to say, and you tend to get stuck in your own head but not when you're listening. When you're really listening, you lose time. There's no sense of yourself because it's not about you. It's all about this task to connect completely to that person. Ideas for action. Make sure the leader is vulnerable first and often. In moments of vulnerability, none carries more power than the moment when a leader signals vulnerability. Try the following. When forming new groups, focus on two critical moments the first vulnerability, and the first disagreement. These small moments are doorways to two possible group paths. Are we about appearing strong or about exploring the landscape together? Are we about winning interactions or about learning together? At those moments, people either dig in and become defensive and start justifying, and a lot of tension gets created, or they say something like, hey, that's interesting. Why don't you agree? I might be wrong, and I'm curious and want to talk about it some more. 
What happens in that moment helps set the pattern for everything that follows. In conversation, resist the temptation to reflexively add value. The most important part of creating vulnerability often resides not in what you say, but in what you do not say. This means having the willpower to forego easy opportunities to offer solutions and make suggestions. Skilled listeners do not interrupt with phrases like, hey, here's an idea, or let me tell you what worked for me in a similar situation, because they understand that that's not about them. Align language with action. Many highly cooperative groups use language to reinforce their interdependence. For example, Navy pilots returning to aircraft carriers do not land but are recovered. IDEO does not have project managers, it has design community leaders. Groups at Pixar do not offer notes on early versions of films. They plus them by offering solutions to problems. These might seem like small semantic differences, but they matter because they continually highlight the cooperative, interconnected nature of the work and reinforce the group's shared identity. Be occasionally absent. New Zealand All Blacks rugby team have made a habit of this, as players lead several practice sessions a week with little input from the coaches. Coaches responded, they were better at figuring out what they needed to do themselves than I could ever be. Skill three, establish purpose. When Coyle visited successful groups, he noticed that whenever they communicated anything about their purpose or their values, they were as subtle as a punch in the nose. It started with the surroundings. When you walk into SEAL headquarters at Dam Neck, Virginia, you pass a twisted girder from the World Trade Center bombing, a flag from Mogadishu, and so many memorials to fallen SEALs that it resembles a military museum. When walking into Pixar's headquarters, it feels like walking into one of the movies, from the full-size Woody and Buzz made of Legos to the 20-foot-tall Luxo lamp outside the entrance, everything gleams with Pixarian magic. What's more, the same focus exists within their language. Walking around these places, you tend to hear the same catchphrases and mottos delivered in the same rhythms. This is surprising, since you could easily presume Pixarians would not need to be reminded that technology inspires art and art inspires technology, that the SEALs would not need to be reminded that it's important to shoot, move, and communicate. And yet, that is what they do. These groups, who by all rights should know what they stand for, devote a surprising amount of time to telling their own story, reminding each other precisely what they stand for, then repeating it ad infinitum. Why? The purpose isn't about tapping into some mystical internal drive, but rather about creating simple beacons that focus attention and engagement on the shared goal. Successful cultures do this by relentlessly seeking ways to tell and retell their story. To do this, they build high-purpose environments. High-purpose environments are filled with small, vivid signals designed to create a link between the present moment and a future ideal. They provide the two simple locators that every navigation process requires. Here is where we are, and here is where we want to go. That shared future could be a goal or behavior. It doesn't matter. What matters is establishing this link and consistently creating engagement around it. What matters is telling the story. When we hear a story, however, our brain lights up, tracing the chains of cause, effect, and meaning. Stories are not just stories. They are the best invention ever created for delivering mental models that drive behavior. High-purpose environments are about sending not so much one big signal as a handful of steady, ultra-clear signals that are aligned with a shared goal. They are less about being inspiring than about being consistent. They are not found within big speeches so much as within everyday moments when people can sense the message. This is why we work. This is what we are aiming for. How do you create one? The answer, it turns out, depends on the type of skills you want your group to perform. High proficiency environments help a group deliver a well-defined, reliable performance, while high creativity environments help a group create something new. This distinction is important because it highlights the two basic challenges facing any group consistency, and innovation. How to lead for consistency. If you spend time around the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, you'll hear them talk about leaving the jersey in a better place and saying, if you're not growing anywhere, you're not going anywhere. Keeping a blue head instead of a red head, which refers to calmness under pressure. Pressure is a privilege. TQB, total equality ball. KBA, keep the ball alive. It's an honor, not a job. 
go for the gap, and better people make better All Blacks. These types of trigger phases can be created for your own organization and be used to generate the energy needed by a high-purpose environment. How to lead for creativity. Creative leadership appears to be mysterious because we tend to regard creativity as a gift, as a quasi-magical ability to see things that do not yet exist and to invent them. Accordingly, we tend to think of creative leaders as artists. Coyle, however, states, when he visited leaders of successful creative cultures, he didn't meet any artists. Instead, he met a different type, a type who spoke quietly and tended to spend a lot of time observing, who had an introverted vibe and liked to talk about systems and processes. He notes these leaders understood that teams are in a better position to solve problems, and a suggestion from a powerful person tends to be followed. Consequently, they stepped aside to encourage creativity, giving outline guidance and then stating, now it's up to you. And to conclude, now it is up to you.